Regents, Blue Cross, Blue Shield of Utah, and Utah State University Extensions. I'm your session moderator, Mercedes Zismer, and our room host is Susie Prevedel. We are available in the chat box at any time during the presentation. Before we get started, I would like to explain a few things about this session. This talking circle session, like the other sessions of the summit, is being recorded and some content may be reproduced or broadcasted at a later time. If for any reason you wish to remain anonymous during the recording, please take the following actions now. One, click the three dots in the upper right corner of your participant panel. Two, choose change profile name and edit your name. Three, make sure your video is off by clicking video icon in the bottom left corner of your screen. If your video is off, there will be a red diagonal line through the icon. If you need assistance with this process, you can message me directly in the chat box by opening the drop down list and typing Mercedes Zisper. This will send me a private message. To ask a question, please either use the raise hand function, which is found in the participation panel, or type your question in the chat box. All participants will be automatically muted throughout the participation the presentation, but can turn the mic on if you have any question. Um, now I'd like to introduce our featured guests for this talking circle session. It's Heidi Peterson and Robin Hatch. Heidi, Heidi Peterson is a certified prevention specialist currently employed as a program manager at regional director for the Utah Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health. Heidi formerly oversaw prevention efforts through the coordination of a communities that care coalition in Tula City. She helps to advise the Parents Empowered Underage Drinking Prevention Work Group, the Utah State Pedemology Outcomes Work Group, and the Utah Faith Suicide Prevention Work Group. Heidi is passionate about helping communities collaborate to make the best use of resources and partnerships to synergize prevention efforts around substance abuse and mental health issues. Robin Hatch has been the prevention coordinator with Northeastern Counseling covering the Northeastern District for over 17 years. She has been a prevention companion and has worked hard to reduce substance use and suicide by address, addressing stigma and promoting collaboration partnerships. During her professional career, Robin has been awarded the 2014 Excellence through Community Action Award, the 2015 Merlin F. Good Prevention Award, and the 2019 Duchesne County School District Extra Degree Award, and most recently, the 2019 Governor's Award. Heidi and Robin, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for that introduction and I'm really excited to be here today. I've been listening in on the summit and I was telling Robin before this presentation how much I appreciate how heart-centered it is, how holistic um, and about the whole person that it is. Um, Robin is truly a prevention champion too so I'm really excited to be presenting with her today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here with you. Hold on one moment. Okay, can you all see that now? We all right? Okay, awesome. Okay, so um, our presentation today is on um, a skill set that is a part of a social development strategy training and uh, people all over the nation and for the world um, in that sense have been trained on this strategy. Um, I first learned it about 12 years ago um, when I took a parenting class and that was my first introduction to prevention work. I kind of dove in as a mom and um, fell in love with the field, with the research that's behind it, and some of these um, very practical and easy to understand things that can help us in our own homes um, and also help us in our um, communities at large. 
So before we dump, jump into what the strategy is, I want to just talk about how important it is that we're beginning with the end in mind. Um, how many of you enjoy a good hike? In fact, I know that I've done more hiking this year because we're so limited on what we can do on the indoors. So if that's something you like to do, um, will you just put in the chat box there, maybe the last hike that you went on um, and where that was. Um, feel free to interact with us that way. Anyway, it's really important when we go hiking, for example, to to begin with the end in mind. If it's go, going to be a three-day backpacking trip, what we're going to take with us is going to be different than if we're going on a half-mile hike and we're going to be back to our vehicles um, by lunchtime. Um, so in our communities, where is it that we want to go? And I think this can especially be an important exercise in the midst of so much chaos and confusion with with 2020 there seems to be a lot of uncertainty so those things um, at home and those things intrinsically that we can um, have some say over those are those can be really important uh, to do there the next analogy here goes right along with a nice hike too and what we're going to be talking about today is a prevention strategy so when we say prevention this is something that we want to stop the use of drugs and specifically for this summit, we're talking about opioids before that's ever even considered. So in prevention, we like to use this parable about a, a man and his wife that were out fishing one day. They're downstream in a lovely setting and um, in, enjoying themselves there. And pretty soon they see somebody uh, swimming down river and really struggling to stay afloat. Um, they're trying to swim, but they're sinking and they're in danger of drowning. So the man and the wife jump in with all their best efforts. They pull this person um, from the danger there. They call an ambulance and they're able to save a life. Well, they resume their fishing and before long, they see another somebody coming down and same situation. Um, and so instead of spending their day fishing, they spend their day pulling people from the river and rescuing people. Well, as this goes on, of course, it starts to occur to them, why are so many people drowning in this river or potentially drowning? So they take some time to move upstream. And what they find is that on the trail, there's a beautiful lookout, but there's some really slippery moss there that people are falling on and so a prevention move in that case would be what um go ahead and and chat in the chat box what what could they do in that instance to prevent the fall um this might look like and i'm not seeing where i can see the comments there i want to be able to see what you're chatting about Let's see if i can find it um, anyway, some of those things might be like they could build a fence, right? Um, they could um, put up a sign that says slippery here. Um, they could say, please stay three feet back. And with some of those preventive measures, it would actually work to help protect those that are getting near the cliff. Okay. So um, another thing we want to talk just a little bit about is understanding that um, there are different things in our community and within our different environments that can pose risk. We talk a lot about uh, this term risk factors a lot when it comes to our health and specifically heart disease. Um, you are all very familiar if we talk about what's a risk factor for a heart attack. Um, people might say uh, different things like a lack of exercise, their genetics. Um, I asked this question once in a big group. I said, what's a risk factor for a heart attack? And a guy clear at the end of the room, back in the back, yelled, bacon. So we know <laughs> bacon may be a risk factor for, for a heart attack there. But just like we know that we have risk factors, we can also do things that will counter that risk and be protective to us. That would be a healthier diet, um, getting more exercise, those kinds of things. So these, those things are protective in nature. So likewise, likewise, we can implement 
different strategies within our homes and within our communities that are also protective. So I want you to stop and think for just a moment um, in your own personal lives. Um, I want you to think, is there a person, and maybe there are several, but who helped you in a positive way become the person that you are today? Um, if you can take a moment, if that comes to you quickly, go ahead, put who that person is and what did they do? What kinds of things did they, did they do that helped you um, in that way? Mercedes or Susie, is there a way I can see the chat? And um, like Heidi, Google. if you press that gray chat button on the bottom of your screen, or if you scroll to the bottom, it'll show up. Or it says that there's a shortcut Alt H. Alt H. I'll try that because it's not showing up in my menu. It might be on the top of your screen when you're in screen share. But um, I can also read them. Okay, yes, Susie, could you do that? Yes, well, my, um, some of the support is my friend and supervisor, um, my mom, my Indian ed teacher, um, sisters, I have three, they supported me, siblings, parents, um, and I'm sure I missed a couple at the top. Okay, good, I was able to open it now, that shortcut worked very well for me, so thank you for that. And I love some of these how um, answers as well. Um, my parents, by showing love, compassion, caring for me and my siblings, ensuring I had good medical care. Um, sisters, I have three and they each helped me to better understand myself in their own way through loving support and challenge. Um, teachers, college instructors, different things like that. Um, I love that. And and uh, like, I appreciate all the feedback here in the chat box, that's, that's awesome. Um, so the beauty of the social development strategy, and I want you to keep those people in mind, and if you didn't have a chance to add one to the chat, go ahead and keep thinking as we talk about this strategy. Um, because what, what this science has allowed us to see is and to do is as we reflect on those that have influenced us and we've seen what they have done, this strategy allows us to be proactive about being that same kind of influence in somebody else's lives that very literally adds protection to them at, as at any stage of life. But again, with our goal being prevention um, as early in life as possible so that um, inappropriate drug use can be avoided. So what I've got pulled up here on my screen now is the social development strategy. So right here in the center, you can see the goal here is healthy behaviors. I want you all to think about um, maybe a child that you know as close to the age of nine um, as possible. I want you to think about that particular child and what does a healthy behavior in their future look like? Um, and go ahead and add that to the chat. What does that mean? What is a healthy behavior that you would wish for that child? Again, if we're beginning with the end in mind, thinking of what that might look like. What are some, some of those things? Go ahead and give you a minute here to do that. Okay, Marcy, thank you to feel emotions and talk about them. That's great. Self-love and to feel secure. Thank you, Sandra. Others being considerate of others, following rules, ability to self-regulate. Okay, awesome. Continue to put those in there. A lot of times people, um, these are very common answers along with this whole sense that we want them to be self-starters. We want them um, to be happy, um, to have respect for others, to be able to have good and healthy relationships and to be able to, to thrive. So what the science behind this social development strategy recognizes is that in order to have that, we've got to have a few things. The very first thing that we need is a very clear standard that is healthy 
um, within whatever domain they're in. So this means in families, we're going to have a very clear sta standard. At schools, we should have very clear standards. And within our community, um, we should also have very clear standards of behaviors. So as they were developing the science though, and they found out how important that is, do you think clear standards were the, if, if you have clear rules and you're really strict about rules, are kids always going to follow them? Um, we know that that is not the case, right? We, we can all vouch for that. Um, so what the science very clearly shows is that there's a combination that's really needed here. And the next step in that is that kids need to feel bonded to the person that is setting that clear standard. So when we talk about bonding, that can be a little bit tricky to, to define because maybe it means a little something different for all of us. But with bonding, we're talking about that intrinsic glue that holds people together. These are the warm, fuzzy feelings. These are the memories. These are those feelings of trust um, that are so important. And I want you to stop and think. I know in my experience, since I've known the social development strategy, I've been able to make an observation that in a lot of families and in a lot of companionships, usually one person is really good at creating clear standards. And maybe the other one is uh, more adherent to the importance of bonding, right? And so when in any circumstance, um, and maybe raise your hand there in the chat box if you've had this, and maybe one parent says, we've got to be stricter. We've got to give a consequence here for this. And the other parent is like, oh, we need to understand where they're coming from and be their friend. Have you all encountered this? Um, I know I did growing up. I had a mom that was more on the clear standard side and a dad that was more like, oh, give them a break. Let's be their friend. This can be a source of a lot of conflict um, in relationships. Well, I've got good news for both sides of that argument because the truth is both are really necessary. So do we need to have clear standards and consequences? Absolutely. And at the same time, do we need to keep those bonds strong and let them know um, that we're there for them? And the answer to that is absolutely as well. So by following the social development strategy, we can learn how to do that. Okay, next slide. Another way to illustrate the social development strategies is with this diagram of a tree. So we can look at those things that we want for our children as these healthy behaviors. A really healthy tree is gonna have really vital and green leaves. Um, the branches here represent the different domains where our kids are gonna be influenced. This will be throughout their community, um, within their families, within their schools, and then also with their peer and individual groups. Um, you can also see the trunk of the tree here represents that importance of bonding. If we just have really clear rules, um, kids are more likely to rebel against those rules unless they have that really secure attachment and sense of bonding with their families. Um, so our healthy beliefs and clear standards here are, are holding down that tree even though the bonding is that trunk and it's helping that grow up straight and tall. Um, something we're gonna talk a little bit more about now, we're gonna dive even deeper into this social development strategy is what goes into bonding. How do we do that? We kind of intrinsically understand what that feels like when it's there and we probably know what it feels like when it's not there, but how can we create that? <clears throat> and that's through providing opportunities giving skills and also um, giving recogni recognition when those things are learned well. So I've got a couple of quick stories to help illustrate some of this. Um, the first one kind of iterates how important it is that we are clear on the standards that are, we are choosing to set for our children. So one of my sons, when he was um, six years old, he was so excited to play t-ball. It was his first experience with organized sports, and he was just super excited for this. Um, so as he went to practice and at home, as we were talking about t-ball, he was instructed that he was to step up to that tee and hit that ball off that tee and then run around those bases just as fast as he could. Well, the day of the first game came, we all showed up, we were excited. I was sitting on the sidelines. He got up to bat and he was able to hit that ball off the tee, 
And he proceeded to literally, as he approached first base, he ran around the base. His foot never touched it. And so, of course, from the sidelines as a mom, I'm yelling to him from the sideline, touch the base, touch the base. Okay? And he's looking back at me thinking he's got a crazy mom on the sidelines. And he's given me some dirty looks there. But he just keeps running. He made it in. Um, but I gave him a little tip from the sideline. I said, you've got to make sure you touch the base. Well, he, he got up again, and instead of listening to me, did the same thing he did before, and he ran around the bases. And so, of course, this time I got a little bit louder and a little more insistent, like, you've got to touch the base. Third time up to bat, he gets up, hits that ball off the tee, and as he approaches first base, just to get his mom to be quiet, he leans over and he touches the base with his hand and then he keeps on running and he looks back at me like are you happy now <laughs> so that story was a real um teaching one for me as a mom because the words that were coming out of my mouth and the coach's mouth didn't really match the clear standard for the game what his coach had told him is hit the ball and run around the bases did my son run around the bases he very literally did and then in my second attempt to help him understand that clear standard, I told him to touch the base. Well, what do we usually touch things with? Our hands, right? <laughs> so he did, he touched the base. Nobody had ever told him to make sure that his foot was touching or tagged that little white block um, so that he was obeying the rules of the game. So I encourage all of you in your different um, areas of influence to consider what your clear standards are and do those that you're talking about really understand what those are. We find that like with um, underage drinking and maybe very much with opioids, do, do we just assume that our kids know what we want for them or have we taken the time to be really clear about that? Um, want to really emphasize the importance of bonding within our families Again, um, as we provide opportunities for our kids to learn different skills and provide that rec uh, recognition for them, and this can happen in all kinds of ways, um, taking fam family vacations together, um, but even like family game nights, having conversations um, at the dinner table. Um, in fact, a lot of research has been done around the idea of family dinners creating um, a secure sense of bonding so much so that um, a larger amount, if, if kids eat family dinner on a regular basis with their families, they are much less likely to experience underage drinking and, and other drug use. Okay, um, so again, as a review, those three ingredients that go in to creating a sense of bonding is providing a skill um, through an opportunity and then giving recognition for that. So I'm going to illustrate this through one more story. This is actually about that same son. I have four kids, but this one gets my social development strategy stories. Um, when he was about three, um, three or four, he kind of had this paranoia about getting sticky. Maybe some of you are like that or have had that with your kids. And so if anything at all, um, this especially happened when he ate pancakes or waffles, if he got sticky, he would lose it. He would have an all out fall apart. Well, um, there came a certain time we were down with my parents and my father recognized this in him and recognized that, you know, if he continued to fall apart every time he got sticky, life might be a little hard for him. So he actually took an opportunity um, to take him to um, we lived in Southern Utah at the time to take him to a hot pot. And before they got there, um, my dad stopped at the grocery store and they picked up syrup and ketchup and soda pop and molasses and every sticky thing that um, they could think of. Um, and because these hot pots were out in nature, they found a place that it was safe to do this. And um, my dad proceeded to open a can of pop and dumped it on his head and he said, sticky is fun. It can be fun to be sticky. And he got some chocolate syrup and just rubbed it on his skin. And my son looked at him like he was crazy, but pretty soon 
he started to do what grandpa did because grandpa said, you know what, go ahead and try it. You can be sticky and still have fun. So they had a great day together. And um, at the end of this, um, in the next couple of days, when he got sticky again, you could literally see my son um, stop before he freaked out. And he would say, sticky is fun, sticky is fun because he was remembering. I actually have a picture of that occasion to share with you here. This is my son at four years old at the <laughs> Pot Tempe Hot Pot, oh chocolate syrup, root beer. And this is where he learned a very, very valuable life lesson. Um, that when life got sticky, he didn't have to fall apart. That sticky can be fun. Um, and you know, this not only taught my son a good resilience skill, but it bonded him to his grandpa. And so much so that we've been able to apply this lesson to other things in life. Um, he's a grown 23 year old now, he just got married. And at different situations in life, when life gets sticky, we remind him that sticky can be fun and it can help us help him grow. Um, it was fun to kind of share this story at his wedding and even draw some analogies that marriage can be sticky too, but it can still be fun and you can have some good life lessons from that. So um, I'm going to turn the time over to Robin now and she's going to give some awesome examples of how she has implemented the social development strategy into her community and her prevention work. Think you're muted, Robin. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Okay, let me. Now I'm having trouble getting back to where I have anything. We can see your slide, okay. Robin. Oh, all right. Oh. So, what I'm going to do, uh, being the prevention quarter, coordinator in the Northeastern District <laughs> in Utah, I'm just going to go over a little bit on how we were able to put the social development strategy into action in our area. One of the things that I really like about this summit is when we're doing these breakouts, I'm getting information that I can bring back to my community. A lot of times when we go to conferences, I feel that the speakers are hitting the majority of the population, which means a lot of these wonderful ideas just can't be put to action in our rural areas. And so a little bit about what my area is. Um, we cover three counties in Utah, the Uinta, Daggett and Duchesne counties um, for a total of 8,508 square miles. Okay. In this large area, we have 35 schools and some of our students have an hour bus ride each way to and from school. And that's if the weather doesn't intervene because if it's bad weather, it could be even more than that. Okay. So what this means with us being so rural is there's really no after school programs in most of our schools. And those that do have after school programs, a lot of the kids aren't able to participate because there's just no way to get them home after, after that activity would be done. We have no boys clubs, we have no girls clubs, we have no big brothers and no big sisters. And those are all programs that are really easy to implement the social development strategy. And we have three prevention workers to cover prevention across the lifespan, which means that we provide prevention services to this entire community from preschool age to our seniors. Um, there's, we need help. If we're going to do the social development strategy to a level that's going to make a difference and impact our community, we needed help. So one of the things that our community is 